I'm Nick Westergaard, and this is On Brand, helping you tell your story. My guest this week is Tom Peters. Tom is co-author of In Search of Excellence, the book that changed the way the world does business and often tagged as the best business book ever. 17 books and 35 years later, Tom is still at the forefront of the management guru industry. He single-handedly invented. What's new? A lot. As CNN said, while most business gurus milk the same mantra for all it's worth, the one-man brand called Tom Peters is still reinventing himself. His most recent effort is the excellence dividend. Tom's bedrock belief is execution is strategy. It's all about the people and the doing, not the talking and the theory. In November 2017, Tom received the Thinker's 50 Lifetime Achievement Award, and he's our guest once again this week. Tom, welcome. Thank you very much. It is once again a pleasure to be here with you. I'm delighted. Well, let's talk about the once again, because you were a guest on the show two years ago, and all of a sudden, a couple of weeks ago, in the midst of all of this, this uh, COVID lockdown uh, altered reality that we find ourselves in. I had an email in my inbox uh, from you and your team, and you're reaching out to 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 talk with folks. So so why why the uh, the the reaching out again at at this time? Well, there's an arrogant strand to this, but I hope not too much of one. I really believe that the way leaders of a 10 person training department or a 12 person business or a 1200 person business, the way that leaders behave relative to the people who work with them throughout this crisis, let's call it the last two months and the next two or three months, what they do, the way in which they do it will be the landmark of their adult career uh, and and you know you said in your introduction you know some of the key things that I've said like people first and so on the things that are most important to me I believe are ten times more important today than they were six months ago you know people first I think is a wonderful way to take care of human beings and people first actually turns out to be a great way to make money uh, but as we have seen, sometimes for good, sometimes for not so good, some leaders have behaved wonderfully toward their employees. Uh, some leaders have behaved significantly less than wonderfully. And uh, so I thought, because I'm sort of famous for raising my voice, that I would find as many suckers like you as I possibly could and scream and shout. You know, into, into my uh, iPad Zoom screen, you know, this is the moment, you know, get with it, be with it. I mean, I ask to God, believe that's not an exaggeration. What you've done for the last two months, what you do for the next three months will be the, will be a defi a or the defining moment of your career. You know, 1918, we had the Spanish flu. People are saying this is a one, once a 100 year event. Uh, most of us, therefore, won't be around for the one in 21, 20. Uh, and what we do now is just, is just crucial. And, uh, you know, my impatience with people who don't go the extra 50. Listen, I understand if you mortgage the house for a 20 table restaurant and there's nobody in the restaurant and you have to pay your mortgage still, you got a problem. And you would absolutely positively, unequivocally love to have all of your people stay, but the reality is that's not gonna be able to be the case. On the other hand, relative to things like unemployment checks and so on and so forth, I think you can be insanely helpful to people. You sure as hell can have a, a positive attitude. You know, I got irritated as you know, I use Twitter a lot. I got irritated earlier this week when somebody showed a, uh, a very nice thing that Brian Chesky, the uh, Airbnb co-founder, had said to employees. 
and then it said at the end of this report, but of course he didn't cut his own pay and didn't do anything like that. And so since, since we are living in a world of Google, I immediately hit his name and discovered that he has a four and a half billion dollar net worth. And the fact that he can say sweet nothings is a little less sweet to me than it was before I read that number. You know, I'm not saying that if he's, you know, nobody's using Airbnb. I am not suggesting that he is responsible for the lives of all his employees. But, you know, you could at least do a little bit of self-sacrifice. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's, it's kind of a mix of, of big things like, you know, headlines like that. Uh, but also, you point to some pretty interesting little things. Now, I should mention, you have a couple of manifestos uh, that you shared prior to this in the run-up that we'll link to at onbrandpodcast.com. I've obviously found them very useful. They're, they're quite dog-eared. Ooh, love all the post-its. <laughs> but uh, you point to an example from Blue Mountain Community College in, uh, in Boardman, Oregon. And it's a great, and, and you cite, you kind of quote the memo specifically yep. in there. Uh, and that, in terms of, well, what's it cost to forego salary? You know, some big things like that. But there's some mindset stuff in there. Yeah. That well, I, you and I must have been thinking the same thing. Because in preparing for this discussion, I actually turned to that page in the paper and it is sitting right next to me because it's actually worth reading, you know? So I will take a minute and a half of our precious time together. This is an April memo to employees by, as you said, Blue Mountain Community College. You are not, this goes one through six, you are not, quote, working from home, unquote. You are at your home during a crisis, trying to work. Two, your personal, physical, mental, and emotional health is extremely important right now. Take care of yourself. Three, and boy, you and I have both heard a lot about this. You should not try to compensate for lost productivity by working longer hours. Four, be kind to yourself and don't judge how you are coping based on how you see others coping. Five, be kind to others and don't judge others in how they are coping based on how you are coping. Six, success will not be measured the same way it was when things were normal. I mean, that, I mean I'm a pretty emotional person, so maybe it doesn't count for much, but that brought me very close to tears. You know, and, and you know, so it's a community college in a small town. To me, that works as much if I'm the CEO of PepsiCo or the Ford Motor Company as it does for whatever, the chancellor or president of that community college. And it's just, it's just so, it's so bloody human and humane and thoughtful. I mean, in the course, which is always true with every damn thing I've been doing for the last four years, if you behave that way toward your team, you're actually gonna end up with a bigger bank account than if you hadn't. I mean, you know, that's when people say, you know, I, you know, well, you can't do all these things. He said, look, the evidence is clear. John DeJulius had this wonderful line. He's a sales trainer and a, owns a, a string of um, uh, salons or whatever that he, that he created. And he said, remember, your customers will never be any happier than your employees. Uh, and so you work like, I work like the Dickens to make Nick have a good day. And if funny thing's going to happen, Nick's going to smile at his customers and I'm going to get rich. You know, and so it's, it's this uh, positive catch 22. You know, somebody said, it was another one liner. If you care about what they care about, they will care about what you care about. And that's a pretty damn good sentence. I was going to, I'm impressed that you were able to recall that and get the order right of all of those uh, similar words. I'd, I'd need to read that one. <laughs> Is that an ageist comment on your part? <laughs> no, I, I, I it's. I, know, uh, I, can't, I just couldn't resist. I'm kind of, <laughs> I, I will say that thank you for the compliment because I am surprised as well. Well, you know, and the other thing that surprised, 
surprises me about that that memo and and first of all the fact that a, that a memo is something that that you want to read and are are drawn to and and emotionally moved by but in hearing it again it, it's incredibly powerful but i'm sitting here thinking this isn't hard this wasn't expensive this you know there were all sorts of reasons why why these kind of memos this kind of action uh, there's, there's, this isn't undoable, and yet it, it's, it's rare. I think that's what your footnote yeah. says. This, this should be the norm. Sadly, it's, it's not. And it brings me back to your other great line about hard is soft and soft is hard. I think this is a case in point of, of soft being hard. Well, before responding to that, and we can talk about this a, a while too. We certainly don't have forever. Uh, A guy who I quoted in The Excellence Dividend, Peter Miller is his name. He's the founder of a mid-sized biotech company called Optinos. And he said, we only hire nice people. And he said, and that applies to a newly minted biochemistry PhD from Harvard or MIT as much as it does to the receptionist. And he said, here's, here's a funny little secret. So this is a very sexy biochemical PhD that we have, and I'm totally turned on by your specs. He said, guess what? There are actually a lot of people in this world who have that degree. Don't hire the jerks. Uh, my point for saying it, and you know, there may well be a tomorrow and things will be slightly more normal than they are now. If you want people to behave like this, hire them this way. You know, I've, I've been writing a lot of stuff that says hire for EQ, uh, you know, the emotional stuff, hire for empathy, for God's sakes. If you want empathetic behavior, hire for empathy. I believe the most important asset in any organization of some size is its first line managers. Never, ever, 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 ever promote anybody into a first line managerial job who is not borderline off the charts on empathy. That's what leading people is all about. And, you know, I will more, be more than happy to sacrifice seven additional calculus courses that you might have taken at Stanford for behaving in a way that would lead you to write a memo like the one you're talking about to get to your answer. Part, I, I've said my entire life can be summarized in six words, which you pointed out. Hard is soft, soft is hard. The numbers, the plans, the organization charts, we call that the hard stuff. They're the soft stuff. I mean, you know, when I talk about this stuff, <laughs> this is not said braggingly, it's said just the opposite. Uh, this is not a philosophy major from a small private school in the Middle West talking. This is a guy talking, me, who has four quant degrees from Cornell and Stanford. So I know the difference between the number one and the number two. And so, you know, I've got my quant creds. And what I'm saying with hard is soft, hard, soft is hard, numbers are abstractions. I mean, for God's sakes, the last time we were in a lot of trouble was 2006 and 2007, and people with IQs of 876 we're creating derivatives that consisted of pieces of paper associated with mortgages that no living human being would ever pay in a million years. Look beautiful on paper. Uh, the spreadsheets were pieces of Picassoian art. Uh, and excuse the language, it didn't mean shit, or it was shit in the real world. So the hard stuff is often soft. The soft stuff is the relationships. It is the culture of an organization. Uh, it is what we just talked about, hiring people because they're nice. I remember there was a wonderful one, uh, and I may, I may pronounce his name wrong, the very famous football coach from the University of Michigan, Bo Schembechler, I think Correct. it was. I got it? Yes! Uh, he, he said we... We usually passed up the hot shots and his incredibly sophisticated and all the people who are listening to us have to really be on their toes now. He said, we passed up the hot shots for 
really good people. And he said, our really good people typically outperformed the hot shots. And the part I really loved, which is kind of like that community college thing, is he said, not only did they outperform the hot shots and we scored more points than the other guys did, but they went on to have more exceptional adult lives after they got out of school, which, alas, is not often the case for the kids who were in varsity division one football who do whatever they do and their life kind of falls apart. I hope they join unions. <laughs> I really, I am totally on the side of, you know, NCAA division one sports are as professional as anything known to humankind. So let them join unions, give them endorsement money, you know, let's cut the crap. Uh, well, that's a different you, conversation. Yeah. <laughs> well, you tell, uh, I thought of that when you, you had the, uh, the Bo Schembechler quote in your work. And uh, my Bo Schembechler connection is uh, my first visit to the University of Iowa campus uh, was to a Hawkeye game where Bo Schembechler was coaching. And fast forward several, several years later, and I'm teaching here at the College of Business. And when you reached out, uh, I actually reached out to uh, the faculty in, in the department that I teach in, which is management and entrepreneurship, and said I was going to be talking to you and said, what, what kind of questions are, are we hearing from students at the undergrad, at the MBA uh, level? And on the undergrad side, the question was really around how grads emerging at this time should prepare for this socially distant, very new, very different world of work. Well, I've got two different answers. The first answer is we don't know. And so do not believe that you can read two articles in the Harvard Business Review and one in Fast Company and get a formula. We don't know. Nobody knows. You know, I've written about this MBWA managing by wandering around and I've had a dozen, dozen questions in the last few weeks. Well, how do you do MBWA with a you know, WFH group? Uh, and to me, at some level, the answer is easy because MBWA didn't really mean a physical thing to me. It never did. It meant being in touch with the people who do the work and being interested in the people who do the work, not sit in your office. But uh, experiment. But it's... I think there's some guidelines, and I don't like to give guidelines because you have to play and you have to learn and you have to, I mean, first of all, for God's sakes, you've got to really enjoy being around the people who work for you if you're a boss or be around, enjoy being around your teammates. Uh, you know, I was just writing about this in, in another paper I was working on this morning, and somebody was saying, you know, you should experiment with a lot of jobs, you should have a lot of jobs, and I said, yeah, you should have a lot of jobs, but in the gig economy, it is no longer your boss who recommends you. It is your peers. It is when they say, hey, you know, I did this project and that Tom Peters guy was there and he was fabulous. I mean, he knew his stuff, but he really helped other people out and he made us feel good on dark, rainy, snowy days. And those are the relationships that get you the next project. Uh, again, like the guy at the pharmaceutical company, there are a lot of people with IQs of over 130. Uh, and so we'll take that as a given. Um, calm down. It's kind of like the community college thing. Uh, something's going on at work and something's going on with important clients and you sit down for a Zoom meeting that's gonna be 45 minutes long. You've got eight agenda items. Hey, you really, 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 really don't have to make it through all eight agenda items. You know, have a human pace. And the other part of it is, you know, I really think, and some people have said this, you know, we've got six or seven of it. Of, and, and, this, and this, again, has to do with who you are as a human being. Uh, it's starting out with a, maybe even going around the table. 
how are things going? How are things with the family? You know, Shelly Dolly, who I work with, who is God as far as I'm concerned, has two teenage girls at home. Well, you know that when you're the boss and you could tease her a little bit about that and, and say something like, you must be happy when we have meetings like this to get a break. And, you know, I mean, you, but you, but the problem that I can't fake is I've got to give a damn about you or Shelly or whoever it is to have that kind of pattern. And that has to do with hiring and it has to do with promoting. Uh, it has to do from with, you know, one of life's great secrets, and that is choosing parents well. Uh, I mean, my my wife is always on my case. She's a she's a Yankee. I'm not uh, because I talk with cab drivers all the time, and so she said, "Why do you talk with cab drivers?" And I said, "Well, it's really pretty simple because they're so damn much more interesting than you and I are." <laughs> You know, you go to Washington, D.C., and your cab driver is likely to be an Ethiopian. He has been through starvation. He has been through a civil war. He probably had a second cousin beheaded four blocks away. He's really had a rich life. You know, I don't know your background all that well, and you don't know mine, but you and I have had patsy lives, you know, by comparison. But you really... You've got to be interested in people. And, and I don't know what to tell somebody. I mean, he, here's this. I was really, really mad because it came out after my last book. Google did a study of its top employees. Uh, this is in one of those papers you mentioned. Yeah. It's top employees and its most innovative teams. There were eight traits associated with top Google employees, seven of the first eight were soft things, like listens, you know, respects people, blah, 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 blah. Then they get into the most innovative team. And Google is one of those stupid institutions that classifies people as A players and B players. Uh, I mean, I've always thought that's fascinating. It is like a guaranteed, a guaranteed tool to completely demotivate 50% of people. Call me a B player and I will respond accordingly. Uh, but at any rate, their B player teams wildly in terms of innovation and project completion, the BZs way outperformed the AZs. And the AZs were at a place like Google, the, you know, the, the low IQs were 220. And they, you know, all had finished Stanford or MIT in 18 months, but they knew it. And they didn't listen to each other. And, you know, one of the traits they found, the, the, one of the, the traits of the winning teams were no bullying. And if you've ever been around a 21-year-old Stanford computer science grad with an IQ of 500, who is well aware of the fact that he's 10 times smarter than you and I combined, uh, but it was just fascinating to see that. Uh, but, you know, your original experiment, be a, I don't know. You tell me. You do this as much or more than I do. If, if you don't have to be chatty Charlie, but I've got to be, I've got to be interested in you. I don't know what you do with that deficit there. I, I mean, I know how to say, stuff which I believe like don't hire you in the first place if you the you know there was this fascinating thing somebody sent me this uh it's a community health organization and they changed their hiring practices and they de-emphasized credentials like university degrees and emphasize credentials like empathy. And they would have meetings of prospective candidates. And if you and I were talking and you're the would-be employer and I'm the employee, if I keep my mouth shut and actually listen to what you're saying, that's a plus. Anyway, for the hard number of people who are listening to us, and you know, I can give you the reference, it's actually one of those papers, so please believe me, Turnover in these organizations was 50 to 75% per year. Turnover now is 
percent. And relative to their clients, their clients is are their clients are going to hospitals 40 percent less frequently than they were two years ago. And it's just because, you know, it's, I mean, I read, the, the, you know, the inadvertent stuff of the new technology. Uh, uh, I read there was an article, you know, I'm near to, I'm 60 miles south of Boston. Uh, Massachusetts General Hospital had a research study and nurses now stand at the bedside entering data on a tablet. And they discovered with hard measures that nurse patient eye contact had gone down 70%. And I mean, you know, let me share with you 500 hard nosed pieces of research that says eye contact, frankly, is more important for your healing than some sexy drug. But I am now, I, I do not always listen to what the President of the United States says. And since we're at home, I now share with my wife the house cleaning task and I do the toilets. And I'm always tempted because of what our leader told us to do to just take a little sip of right. Lysol <laughs> and to see if it'll present COVID, you know, prevent COVID-19. I get that little thing in my hand that stinks to high heaven, but I think this will save me anyway. Forget that comment, you can erase that. No, well, I, I think it's it's a worthwhile one, and it, it ladders up all the way as we talk about leadership, because I'm reminded of at these at what's a historic moment in our lives, in our country, and you look back at other moments, you talk a lot and, and write a lot about, about Churchill and about FDR, and and I, I love in in the last book uh, and elsewhere you referred to uh, Churchill as an average military strategist and uh, and FDR as an average economist. But it was those other skills, that battery uh, of but the one, the one that's, and I will, you know, if the if the cameras are good and catch the details, I will probably tear up. Uh, on the eve of D-Day, June 5th, 1944, the British General Montgomery gave a speech to the troops and they said it was one of the most stirring, incredible, magnificent speeches that had ever been given. Eisenhower, which was typical of Eisenhower and probably God bless the Midwesterners, typical of somebody who comes from Kansas, uh, Eisenhower, went down to the areas where the troops were, you know, getting organized to go. And he walked along in a uniform that had no medals and put his arm around soldiers and sailors and just wished them well on the line. They got this out of a diary. <laughs> I, I'm, you know, I'm screwing it up right here with tears. The, the line was, parents were willing to send their boys to die for him. I mean, good Lord, what a comment. Yeah. And it was just, I mean, I don't know if you can see it. I'll give you a close up. But, and I, you know, I've, given, I've said this in speeches 50 times, and, you know, I'm not tearing up. They're actual tears. I've said it 150 times. This is not the first time it came out of my mouth. Parents are willing to send their boys to die for him. And that is all about, and, you know, per your comment about my comment with, with uh, you know, with uh, Churchill and so on, is Eisenhower was a very second-rate strategist. But what he did is the secret in D-Day was to keep the British and the Americans from killing each other until we had time to go across the channel and get to the bad guys. And he held the coalition together, uh, Churchill, De Gaulle, uh, Roosevelt, Montgomery, totally crazy human beings like Patton, and he kept the, kept the alliance together. And that's the essence of leadership. Yeah. And it's the essence of leadership, obviously with much less significance than D-Day, in a car dealership or a 15-table restaurant or a seven-person training department. So all of this has one-for-one one exact 
translation into the real world of the people who are watching or listening to us or your life or my life. Well, and, and it makes me think of, you know, really your work being about excellence, but you say quite often, you know, we think of excellence as a great big writ large thing, but you're very clear about excellence is, is, is short term. And I think especially at an inflection point, like where we are right now, that's, that's magnified even further. So if excellence is the ultimate short term strategy, if it's the next five minutes, what should someone listening think about and think about doing next? Ask people how they're doing and ask them how they feel and ask them about their families. Uh, this, is, this is a, I mean, this is a, silly statement because it's so obvious this is about one at a time parents children aunts uncles the 83 year old next door neighbor who doesn't have anybody to really look after her or him uh and always keep that in mind keep people's context in mind and uh be gentle uh there's a wonderful book carol sanford is her name and she wrote a book called No Feedback. And the book is about how virtually no leader gives effective negative feedback. They are excellent at destroying otherwise good human beings. But my point is not to review her book, but to say, really be careful on critical comments. Um, you don't really right this minute have to beat the crap out of somebody because they were an hour later, a day late with a deadline. You know, Mrs. Jones across the road, as I said, is 83, and she's really having trouble, and you spent a couple hours with her. Uh, and, you know, God bless you. Uh, and so go gently. I, there's, I, there are a lot of quotes about this, but unfortunately, I am an engineer, so we didn't study any of that stuff. But go gently in the world. Be kind. Be thoughtful. Be caring. Uh, and just try to help people have a little, I won't say a better day, but a little less worse day than they might have had before they chatted with you during that. As you said, my, my one liner is excellence is the next five minutes. It's the next conversation. And that's clearly also the answer, though you do have to experiment with your Zoom meetings or whatever other kind of contact you have but be helpful be caring be thoughtful be patient don't go negative negative feedback never works uh, you know there's hard science that says positive feedback is 30 times more powerful than negative feedback and I remember one time when you know I lived in the San Francisco Bay Area and, and John Madden was coaching the Oakland Raiders and he said I never worry about players' weaknesses. I worry about helping them get better at what they do best. And if you can't go to your left, I'll find a guy <laughs> you know, to stand next to you and worry about that. What I want you to do is take these excellent talents for which I hired you and get better and get better at that. Uh, you know, it's, we could have another two hours on the topic of the, of the unnecessary psychological and performance cost of poorly given negative feedback well to stay away from the that's negative, the next time we get together <laughs> well to stay away from the negative and to amplify the positive as we wrap up tom what is a brand that has made you smile recently well i gave a speech in indianapolis it's always hard for me because I grew up with the Baltimore Colts and then they left town. <laughs> um, and we had some people from Hammond, Indiana who were there. And I took a photograph at home. This is when I lived on a farm in Vermont uh, before I came to the meeting and it was my first slide. And this was 2015 and it was a photograph 
of my beloved 2004 Subaru Outback covered with mud. Uh, I love my Subaru. <laughs> I really, really love my Subaru. It's a you know, pretty inexpensive car in Vermont. The joke used to be it was the state car because it you know rides high off the road and handles the handles the ruts and the mud and i was never a car guy i was never a car guy my actual first car was a 1951 chevrolet but that dates me a little bit ha ha we already knew that um but i i love my subarus you know and i you couldn't i i did i think i think i had a saving moment thanks to my Subaru. I was on Martha's Vineyard visiting somebody and I was driving like hell through somewhere. It was kind of a funny story. And a cop, and it was a, there was a local speed limit sign that was 25 or 30. And so the cop stops me, comes over, and he said, Do you know how fast you were going? I looked at him with a smile and I said, Do you want an honest answer or the answer I'm supposed to give a cop? I said, The honest answer is, I don't have a clue and he started laughing hysterically he said i've been doing this job for 15 years nobody has ever said that to me well that was funny and good for me for saying something funny i'm convinced it's because the vineyard is loaded with beamers and mercedes and i was driving a 12 year old subaru with a vermont license that was covered with mud and uh you know that's the you know that that's the patent for not getting tickets but you know it's, that's a that's that's on my favorite list no, I, don't, I don't know what's at the top of my favorite list uh, uh probably foods i shouldn't eat and uh i haven't had anything to drink since 2005 and wines i used to drink i mean we can go, we can go, we can go through a pretty long list well that's that's great and and certainly a, a brand that makes you smile as is evident here and it's making me smile here the hearing the story about uh, about your honest answer so one more honest answer from tom where can folks go to learn more about what you've written what you've put together recently and and what you're up to uh simplest question in the world <laughs> tompeters.com we have literally got for example the slides for every presentation I've given in the last 15 years. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of stuff and probably 75% of it's crap. I don't know or remember, but everything is there. You know, I really, I really do believe and it's not because of Christian charity. It's because of whatever it is. If you give stuff away, people, that's a net, you know, what was the, there was some, somebody wrote a book called the gift economy or something like that. Yeah. You, know, you you give it away and it rebounds positively. So for better and for worse, I'm <laughs> sure you will find every piece of crap and also occasionally intelligent something uh, at the website. Well, and we think it's pretty easy to navigate. So well, I, I think for worse would be a, a bit of a stretch. But on the off chance folks can't remember, TomPeters.com. You can find the links to everything that we've talked about at onbrandpodcast.com. Th Tom, thanks for joining us once again on Brand. Thank you for inviting me for the second time, which is always a good thing. You know, you're, you're welcome to come back, but thanks so much. And I would love to do it again at some point because this was good fun. Awesome. I do these things because they're fun and, uh, you know, got to get a kick out of it. Well, we've so had fun. And we sure hope the audience has had fun. And uh, folks, until next week, I'm Nick Westergaard, and I'll see you on the internet.